Alrighty, so what my plan is then, um, I think I'll start with, I think I'll start with mine, which kind of talks about what we do, why we do it, some of the things we do, a few case reports. Um, I have a great case report of a fox, but I have not been able to get it on there, but I can definitely show you pictures on my computer so you can see how well he's doing now. He's currently in the hospital. And then, there's a reason all these stuffed animals are up here. I would like each one of you to come up and grab a stuffed animal. And everybody is going to be doing their own physical exam on this stuffed animal. So you understand, if you get an animal in, you need to understand how to examine it. Are we ready? Yep. So, the animal, has, the animal that you, we're going to practice the physical exam part, okay? None of you are licensed or anything. You are walking down the road or you're at your house and somebody just ran up to you and said, oh my gosh, I found this injured animal. Can you please help me with it and get it where it needs to go? And you say, absolutely. I know the contacts. I'm well trained in this. I'll be more than happy to help you. So you put that animal in a secure container, such as a, a cardboard box is probably the best thing, or a very kennel, anything like that. And then um, let them get all of their information down, where they came from, uh, where the animal came from, when did they find it, did they give it any treatments, anything like that that could possibly help the person that's gonna be treating this animal. Then they leave and you let the animal chill for a while, and then you decide, okay, I gotta look at this animal and see if there's anything going on. So you're going to, number one, observe your animal, just how it's sitting in its, in its carrier, or box, or whatever it is. If it's in a cardboard box, what I will sometimes do is I'll take like a little knife very carefully and cut a circle in it, so I can kind of peek in the box and watch. And the things you're going to want to watch for are, our, are holding their head up. If it's a bird, you want to watch for any fluffing of the feathers. Um, any animal, you want to watch for their breathing pattern. If it seems really, really, really fast or non-existent. If they seem like they're falling over, um, looking weak and lethargic, vomiting. Seizuring, those are all things that you can tell what's going on with the animal visually. And by visually looking at them, you can get a respiratory rate, which is very um, important when you start working with them because you want to make sure you get what are called vitals. And that can, that's a heart rate, a respiratory rate, a temperature, a mucous membrane color, and then a capillary refill time, and then plus or minus a blood pressure. All of those vitals help determine what the metabolic status is and the overall body status of that animal. So now you've looked at your animal. It seems like there's a lot of blood in the carrier. So he's obviously bleeding from somewhere. And can anybody tell me, out of those of you that have your, if you have your animal, Raise your hand if you think the blood in the cage is something that you need to address immediately because it could severely be detrimental to that animal. What do you have, Barnabas? Yes. Do you have a skunk? I have a skunk. Okay, that's, that's Barnabas, yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you've got, who else raised their hand? You, you, you raised your hand? You raised your hand? Uh, and in the checkered flannel shirt right there, you raised your hand, right? No, I didn't. It raised, you raised your hand. You oh, I did, okay. <laughs> Anybody else have a bird? Probably not. Okay. You're wrong. Okay. Right by his heart. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but he's the CPR one, so. <laughs> 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 okay, so you are. 
that from the lower <laughs> That's from my, other, that's from my <laughs> veterinary training. Okay, so the reason I say that is um, <laughs> if you see a lot of blood in there with yes, with any animal, it is something that we want to address right away. But with birds, you want to bump that up even more because birds um, can only lose 10% of their body weight. And as soon as they lose that and become anemic, they have a higher percentage of dying right there, especially when they're stressed. It doesn't take much. And if we have that much blood in the box, and we can only imagine how much blood was lost mm -hmm. outside, we could be doing in for a serious, serious ride with this bird that's going to need oxygen therapy, IV catheter, uh, all the supplements to help get its hemoglobin and everything back up to where it needs to be. So, there's a little hint for you. Birds, blood, bad. So, stop the bleeding wherever it's at, bandage it. It doesn't matter and get it to a vet. That's one thing that's pretty serious. Okay. All right, so, look at your animal. And when you're doing a physical exam, the first, you always want to start from the head and go to the butt, head to tail. And you got to put yourself in that repetitive, um, using my train of thought so if somebody can bump up what I'm trying to say, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> in that repetitive um, motion, constant repetitiveness. Um, Consistency. Yeah, Thank routine. You. Routine. Routine. That's even better. That was that, okay. was that gentleman over there. Have you, have Give him a star. Have your exam. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> have, your, have your. Have your. <laughs> <laughs> ready. And so you've got your patient. It's all ready. And you're like, okay, I have all my supplies ready. I got my stethoscope. I got my thermometer, my bandage material, meds, catheter, blah, 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 blah. So you start at the head, work your way to the tail. Now when you're starting at the head, one of the first things you want to do is look at the head and make sure that it's symmetrical, that it looks like a head, that, that one side isn't bigger than the other, or the jaw doesn't look displaced. Um, you can also run your hands along the jaw if the animal lets you and um, be able to make sure that this feels symmetrical on both sides. Then you're going to want to check the ears. Make sure the ears don't have any damage to them. Look inside the ears to see if there's any blood, any parasites, any fluid, um, and address that if needed and make a note of it. Birds have their ears though way in there, don't they? They do. They have little, little they ears. have little they have little tiny ears. Is there any on the owl right there? Um, Sometimes there's a little bump. Sometimes but otherwise, in some no, of these stuffed animals, they'll it's stick them. It's not a tick. Yeah, they'll <laughs> stick them in the <laughs> <stuff. laughs> It's not a tick. It's got a wood tick. <laughs> it's what he said, it's a tick. <laughs> Um, they just have holes. Yeah, they have they? little they tiny ears. They don't stick out. They just kind of. Just like the hood owl does, or whatever. The other owls have. Don't they? No. Those are and owls those are tufts. And, yeah, that's. They have tufts, but yeah, their ears are kind of um, within their. I don't want to say skull, but um, they're kind of con I'm not even concave in, but they don't stick out as they do yeah. in mammals. Mm -hmm. Um, and that goes the same for reptiles as well. Yeah. No, you're like, um, but still you can look at them and see yeah, if there's any blood, any discharge, anything like that. Um, and then you're going to look at the eyes. So if your patient comes in and there's any, any type of trauma, your eyes are going to be a very big um, part of your physical exam. And sometimes it may even be what's going to be your call of do I euthanize this animal or do I not. So you want your eyes to be symmetrical. And this is where it's very important um, to have a pen light. And if you do decide to become a rehabilitator or work with a rehabilitator, then you'll learn all the instruments and um, items that you need to be able to function appropriately. So you would take your pen light and you would make sure that the eyes are symmetrical. Does anybody have a pen light here? Mm -hmm. 
have or a any little room. flashlight or anything? Mm -hmm. Tony, do you have one? Carrie's the one with her. Do you? I know yeah. you do. Oh, I have a big one, but that's not going to work because it's it snored. Where did I put my car? It what? snores. Yeah, it's oh, okay. Oh, you know what? Wait, wait, wait. Here we go. Here it is. Oh, I got one. God, look at that. I have one on me. Okay. So we'll let we'll let these guys practice back here. Okay. So you got that. <laughs> That'll make the animal real happy. Oh, yeah. It's just big. Yeah, that, I'm going to get the wrong And so Tony, Tony, Tony gets an owl. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to try and show this to you. <coughs> so you're going to take your light. I did it to my dog. You're going to shine it into your patient. And you're going to shine one eye. And you see the outer portion of the eye. And then you see that inner portion of the eye. Now, that eye if you go to this eye, should look the same way. Sometimes the eyes are going to be moving. Sometimes the one portion of the pupil is going to be smaller than the other portion of the pupil. Those are all um, signs that can relate to head trauma and that there is something cooking in the brain that we need to make sure we get veterinary attention to. So, Go ahead and practice that. I don't know if any of the animals you have have already been um, worked on. I got yeah, deformed. Yeah. yeah, and that's my project. Regions and blood a whole hole. I have no I have, to, hole. Hole. I have to make problems with all these he animals good before eyes. this weekend. That's one of the so you make sure your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth. If the animal's aggressive, you know, when they're barking at you, that's a good chance. That's a good time to get a really good look at their mouth. No, I to play I wish I could. I might later. I might try to bring up that picture. I have a picture of a fox that I'm working with, and he is barking at me, and it's a really good picture of his mouth because I can see how inflamed his mouth is. And by, just by seeing that and not touching it, I knew that I needed to put him on a special type of antibiotic to try and combat that. So your head's done. Now you're going to move to your neck. Make sure the neck feels okay. Um, they, birds, they have air sacs in their necks, so you want to make sure it doesn't feel poofy. And one part of the um, neck is not blown up over the other. And then you're going to move down to the chest. And you're going to listen to that chest with your stethoscope. Make sure you don't hear any crackles. <laughs> Same for the abdomen. You don't want to hear any crackles. <laughs> What's so giggly? Tony. Tony. <laughs> and you can do that. You can just be careful. Yeah, the thing will bite you. You know, he's going to bite your face off. <laughs> <laughs> this guy would kick me. Exactly. <laughs> That's um, why I was laughing. So then you'd want to listen to your... Listen with your stethoscope all over the chest and abdomen area. Um, with rabbits, you want to hear the stomach making these little gurgly sounds. Okay. If rabbits don't make the little gurgly sounds, that can mean that they are in trouble. Especially if they're going through some type of trauma and had been hit by a car. Okay. So that's just a little note to remember in the back of your head. Um, then you're going to go on to the extremities, make sure the legs, hooks, wings, all of those look symmetrical, any damages, any um, bruises, tears, bites, anything like that that is abnormal. Even if it's just the maybe missing, missing feather number five from the radio ulnar area. And you'll just mark that down on your sheet. The, the more precise you can be, the better. So, there, and then you've, you've done your complete physical exam. Don't forget to listen, put your stethoscope, get in the heart rate. Oh, and then you gotta look at the rectum. No blood, no parasites. Um, and then uh, get a temperature if the animal is that debilitated that he'll let you get, or she will let you get one. Um, and then 
address it from there. What are their temps supposed to be? Ooh, good question. Depends on the animal. Most animals are a little bit higher than we are, so you know, if you safely put in, kind of what I do is I'll safely put in my head 100 to 103. Okay. 103 might be a little on the high side, but 100 is 100, 101, 102, I'm not going to worry too much about. Okay. Um, I got in a fawn that was hit by a car, seizuring. That temperature went up to 108. Oh no. And then I knew I had a problem. Oh, and that's when you have to yeah. start cooling them down very slowly, which is another thing. If you think something is freezing, it's super yeah. cold, or so or hypothermic, or if you think it's hyperthermic and it's really hot, make sure that any supplemental heat or cooling that you do is slow. Okay. You know, it, they used to be, you know, years ago they would recommend that you would take your animal and then put it in a tank and wash it yeah. down with a cold water yeah. hose. Well, that actually and what that can do is that can actually put the system into shock and then the system reacts to that cold water and then they end up having a cardiovascular reaction from it. So what has worked best is, you know, you could throw some alcohol or ice cold water on their feet and then soak some cold towels, which this is just for a heated animal. Yeah. Soak some cold towels and then wring them out and just lay them over the animal and then change them out every five, 10 minutes, how, how it needs to be. And you'll be surprised how fast that temperature comes down with that. And you can do that with the warm too? Yes, okay. yes. If they're warm, don't you, I probably wouldn't use warm wet because okay. as soon as you take it off, that wet so is like gonna turn cool. Heating pad So or... just use, uh, you can use a heating pad, make sure there's a little towel over it, and then you're gonna have to make sure you move that patient around so okay. it doesn't get that heating pad burn. Okay. What we have found that works really, really well are putting towels in a dryer hmm. and then letting them be heated from the dryer. Um, it is not recommended to put them in a microwave. No. From personal experience, <laughs> it started a fire. No. <laughs> <laughs> And the whole clinic smelled like burnt towel for a week. <laughs> um, I don't think they knew it was me, though, because they never did confess to it. <laughs> don't, don't worry, you realize this is going on the internet. What? This is going on the internet. Oh, no! <laughs> 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 oh, 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 Strike that. Just kidding. Get that out of there. As far as temperatures, though, for opossums, their temperature range is much lower. Okay. And, and that's where we go with this. every species is different. Mm -hmm. I haven't worked with many opossums, so I don't know what their temperature is. It's like 93, 94. They're like the lowest. Okay. So, like, there's okay. something. But other than that, I think they're all pretty much. Yeah, give or take. You know, each one is going to be different. And Birds the do. best thing is try to find the best resource that you can find to be able to have the resources that you need. Um, and then uh, another thing that works great is taking a pair of nylons or a sock, dumping it with um, rice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and tying it off, and then you can use that as a cold pack, or you can use it as a warm pack. You can stick it in the freezer. Yeah. And um, another thing that works good is your expired fluid bags. You can take some of the fluid out, throw them in the freezer or in the refrigerator so they're always cold, mm -hmm. and then use that when you need to cool an animal down as well. So there's a variety of things, and you can do that for them when they need to warm up too. Like Tony has. Mm -hmm. Well, you can use empty pot bottles too. You can just pour hot water into a pot bottle to heat them or cold water to cool them. Yep. It's a real quick, if yep. you don't have a microwave handy. Yep. Yeah, you just want, the, it, you can pretty much use anything. Um, heat lamps work. You just want to make sure that you're watching the animal, um, rotating them periodically, and making sure they don't get heat exhaustion from it. And 
Also, um, if they are on a heating pad, we've seen quite a few animals, you know, just be on a heating pad for an hour, and the next thing you know, they've got a burn underneath their fur and their skin. So we really want to, really want to stress the fact to watch that closely. So, so there is your brief physical exam, and now you are ready to ship your animal off to your veterinarian or to a center that sees wildlife. On the back of these packets, there are a bunch of facilities throughout the Twin Cities. I don't know if you got Oh, you did get it. Okay. There is one that... I haven't updated this, and there is one that we're going to put on there, but we'll do that at the end of the night. Um, and then the, the week is on all these, so you obviously know that. Okay, let's move on to the PowerPoint. Okay, so we're going to talk about... Uh, I don't want to stand in anybody's way, so if I'm in your way, just tell me to move. Am I in your way? No. So we're going to talk about why, why do we want to treat wildlife, what do we do when it presents to a veterinary hospital or yourself, how you can be prepared for the proper care of some of the organs, for emergency and critical care basics, species specifics, and then we've got a few case studies. So the advantages to treating wildlife are all listed here. Can anybody think of any others that might want to go up on that board? Fun. <laughs> Someone who said fun. Fun. <laughs> fun. fun. Lack of sleep, but fun. <laughs> so enjoyment, personal yes. enjoyment. Mm -hmm. yep. Good for na nature. What dear? Good for nature. Helping conservation. Yep. Is that all we got? So we've got personal enjoyment, conservation, a release, gratifying, awareness, business opportunity, community service, training experience, and of course, helping the animal. Mm -hmm. Good basis to cover? Mm -hmm. So, this is a big problem with rehabilitation, is money. Um, we try to function on donations and volunteers, but people that donate and people that volunteer can easily become burned out. Nothing's going to burn you out faster than some, an organization that, con that continuously needs you and needs you and needs you, and there's only so much of us we can give, so we have to be very um, aware of being able to spread that around. So, yes, the stuff costs money, but there are ways to get that money, and there are ways around it. The wildlife need the help. And it's simple. Mm -hmm. Now, I know a lot of veterinarians have um, came to me and said, why are you even doing this? It's a waste of time. The rabbit's just going to get killed again when you, set, when you release it. And... What difference does it make? And why are you wasting all your resources on one little rabbit? And I just say that, you know what? God put me here for a purpose. This is my purpose, and I'm just doing my job. Mm -hmm. You know? Every, every species is different, and I have to at least give it a try. Um, we want to show exposure and to have some staff training with a variety of species because that will engage the staff. It will engage your volunteers to be able to work with the different species. Go home and say, wow, I worked with an otter today. It was really cool. And kind of fill you with that love again that you have for your job. It also makes you stand out from other people. And everything that you do advances the medical knowledge for the exotic animal world. Mm -hmm. Money can come from grants, tax deductions, working with a private organization, um, asking for donations every time the government presents a facility. We are not allowed to charge a fee, but we can ask for a donation. That donation may be one penny or it may be $5. 
$500. It's whatever the person has and wants to donate. And then our big one is the fundraising. And this is something that all the nonprofits would easily say we don't do enough of because they are a lot of work to put together, and but they are a lot of fun when you can get them together and get great things donated to be able to sell off at a silent auction. So that, for anybody getting, wanting to get interested and get, get their foot in the door with certain facilities, starting with fundraising would be a great way to do it because you're, with your wit in the fundraising committee, you're in the heart of it because nothing's going to be able to continue functioning, functioning if we don't have the money. And then as you get new clients in, um, some will be willing to pay for the specific um, treatments that are done on the animal. And I can use an example. Um, just in January, I received my first call of the year. It was on a Canada goose up in Golden Valley, I believe. And it was, limp it was limping and its wing was just kind of drooping. And my friend and I went up there, we captured the goose, brought it back, did some evaluation on it, and it was a very, very old wing fracture, which meant he was never, ever going to fly again. So we ended up having to put him down because he was not going to be released back in the wild. Mm -hmm. And he was very feisty, so he wouldn't even do good in a permanent placement. He would be really stressed. Um, and I contacted the lady that contacted me. She was very appreciative of everything. And two weeks later, I got a check in the mail for $200. Oh, wow. Because of what I did for that goose. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people out there that are very appreciative and will help support your cause just out of the blue without you even knowing it. And sometimes for the simplest, simplest things. So, um, this part is kind of um, um, directed towards a veterinary hospital, but you can direct it towards yourself when you are answering the phone if anybody <coughs> calls you if you are on the call list for wildlife. Um, you want to make sure that you have a specific entrance in your home where you have the wildlife come in. Now, if you only have one front door, then you make sure that you bring them in the front door and then you have a specific room that you, do, that you direct them to. They gotta have an isolation area, especially the raccoons, the foxes. Um, oh, those are probably your two main ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Your raccoons and your foxes and some of your birds if they have an upper respiratory issue. Um, we already talked about the enclosed transport. And then uh, when you're on the phone, you want to try and triage over the phone. So you ask the person, so what's going on with the animal? Is it standing? Is it lying there? Is it feisty or is it very debilitated? Bleeding. So is there a lot of blood? Is there seizuring? That way when the animal's coming to you, you kind of have an idea of what you're going to be expecting. And then the big thing you want to let people know is how to handle it and be, let them be very aware of zoonotic diseases because that is something we want to make sure the public is aware of. So if your good Samaritan drops off, let's say, a flying squirrel, you're going to want to, of course, greet them, get the history, make sure that you have a surrender form so that they sign it and understand that this animal is no longer theirs. They cannot claim it. They cannot, they can call and ask about it, but you could state that on your surrender form that no calling and mm -hmm. asking about it. Every place is different. Once you get to a big enough organization like WRC, calling everybody that brings in an animal is almost impossible. You know, though they they're able to send out little business cards and stuff, but that's a pretty that's a pretty big project. Inform them that the animal will be properly taken care of. Thank them. 
And then if that animal needs to go to, say, WRC or WRR or me or to the vet, you can certainly ask the person if they'd like to transport it. And that may help them with the whole process. So what do we got? Bunny, a ducky. What is it? Isn't that a bunny up there? Right here. A squirrel? No. It looks like a bunny to me. Do you want a piece of candy? It looks like a bunny. It's a rabbit. Yep, thank you, bunny. See, I had one of those, I know. <laughs> what do we got here? A fawn. Very good. Here? That's yeah. a ducky. Goose. A baby goose, is it? No, it looks like a goose. Tony. Tony. You don't got candy, Tony. <laughs> See, I, get, I get two pieces. <laughs> there. If they're not a client of yours sure. or if they're not somebody that you've worked with in the past, um, don't be surprised if you will hear more from them because once they've had a connection to you, um, then they're going to want to continue to use you. Mm -hmm. So, when you are handling your animals, make sure you have proper PPE. Who knows what that means? There's candy involved. <laughs> PPE. Well, this man over here had the answer equipment. first. No, I. What? Personal protective equipment. Very good. Heads up. <laughs> Look, and you get peanut butter. No, you can get it. Oh, you guys can come up with that. You guys can come up with that. Me. When that was shut. So yes. Personal protective equipment, very, very important. Um, there's some species specifics of, there's certain animals that you absolutely need to wear huge welder gloves with. And then there's certain animals that you can get by with a pair of gardener gloves with. Um, and then some you need goggles and some you don't. So knowing each species defense mechanism <coughs> is what's going to um, push you towards what types of personal protective equipment you're going to need. And sometimes they need to be knocked out. That is not always the best thing for the animal, but if they are highly stressed and extremely aggressive, I feel that why not knock them out? Because mm -hmm. then that will calm them down. I don't have to worry about getting bit. I don't have to worry about them getting hurt. And I can take care of everything I need to do. And these are some drugs that we use at our veterinary facility. Um, all of them can be used in various situations to help make these guys um, go to sleep. And then, of course, you have the big decision, euthanasia or treat. Mm -hmm. I recently got into chipmunk this week, and it had severe head trauma. It was bit by a cat. And his whole top part of his head, and I think I had pictures of him too, the whole top part of his head was all ripped off, and he was all swollen and scabby right around his eyes, and that was one of the questions where I'm like, oh gosh, this should be euthanized, and then I'm like, but I've seen so many head traumas turn around. And then he kind of got up and moved around a little bit, and I'm like, I'm going to give him a shot, see if he makes it overnight. And so I loaded him up on antibiotics, fluids, <laughs> pain meds. I did the high, end, high dose of everything. And that little chipmunk was alive in the morning, and then ate a grape. Oh, wow. He ate some soft Cheerios, and... He's drinking his water, and every day we are going a little bit stronger. We're putting eye meds on him, and I think he might be able to start seeing out of one of his eyes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not completely optimistic, but I have to say it's it could he could maybe get released if he can get his vision back. Get the, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of his head. What? And the rest of his head. Yeah, we'll have to have to grow his hair back. <laughs> Oh dear. So this little bird right here, 
you can see this really bad fracture. Um, that would be, that, without a doubt, that would be a euthanasia. Because that bird is never ever going to be able to fly again. Mm -hmm. And then you always want to think about all the, the different things with youth, when, when euthanizing of the questions to ask. Okay, <coughs> is it non-releasable? So yes, if it's non-release, if it's got a situation where it's non-releasable, then I got to find a veterinary facility or a uh, education facility to be able to release it to which, depending on the bird, depending on the animal, you might have to go through channels and channels of paperwork. Does it have a possible zoonotic disease, such as a bat? Now, mm. the tricky thing with bats is them in mating season resembles them having rabies. Mm. Similar effects, mm. which I personally thought was kind of funny. The man looks like he's having rabies when he feels like he wants to get a little frisky. <laughs> so, um, that's a hard one to, to know like when to send and when not to send. So, what I would do is if it's an animal such as a bat, which is one of our high carriers of rabies, and it happened to die, automatically send that off. And if it's really debilitated, really sick, constantly seizuring, I would euthanize it and I would send it off for rabies testing because it's for the safety of other animals and the safety for us. And you know, also that animal doesn't need to be suffering through those seizures. Is the animal suffering? So kind of covered that already. Um, if we want to treat, how much is the treatment going to cost? So, say, say we're going to treat this little bird, and that bird's going to need a little surgery, he's going to need probably some pins put in there, and probably some wound debridement, maybe some tissue management, and he's going to need a veterinarian to do that. I can tell you from my end and my experience to fix that, is probably going to be anywhere between five and seven hundred. Wow. But that's also at an emergency and referral center. So um, <coughs> that's another thing you want to make sure you keep in the back of your mind and then you talk to your vet about. And then what, after it's been treated, what, what's after? What is like, okay, we got the bird treated, the surgery's done, all great. Now what? Now's the rehab portion. So it's the physical therapy every day, it's the swimming, it's the rotating of the arms, it's all kinds of stuff, or the wings, I mean. So those are all things that you wanna ask yourself as well. Was it born with a handicap? And is that why it's preventing a release? Um, some animals out there are, have had a handicap their whole life and then they happen to come in because maybe they got hit by a car. That's not a reason to not release them because if they've been surviving out there that long, then chances are they can keep going. And then if you're unsure, you contact your mentors and your people that you know who to contact. Oh, a dragonfly. So some of the things, isn't that a great dragonfly? I love those. I can't remember this pond, something pond, dragonfly. Um, they're from Florida. They're Just beautiful. beautiful. Um, so some of the things you're going to see, of course, orphan. <coughs> What's HPC? The disease of some, some sort. Hit by car. <laughs> hit by, by car. car. Got a Reese's. It said hit by a car. There you go. You got it, Emma. Yeah, that was from that was from Tony Elfie. The peanut gallery over there. I said a disease. I said a hit by you a car. You said what? I said disease. It's not it's HPV. <laughs> then she said the car, and then I got it after. <laughs>
double words in there, and that would be human, human, which tells us that we are a pretty significant problem of some of these animals. Mm -hmm. Who could tell me what HGW is? Hogs gone wild. <laughs> Hitting glass window. What'd you say? Hitting glass window. I got oh, the there. first part of it. You said heading. <laughs> no, I said hitting. Yay! Nice <laughs> yeah. yeah. I said hitting. You did say hitting. You didn't say glass window. No, but I knew you it was something. So give me half that peanut butter. <laughs> I have it. Um, get it to me. Poisonings. There are a ton of them. Um, there's a lot of buildings and organizations that will go out and spread out this pigeon poisoning to when they don't want the pigeons around. And then also, some of the stuff that we just throw in our trash, these animals will find in the dumpster and some of that can be highly toxic to them. So they'll come in and they may be shaking, tremoring, and we may not be able to figure out what's going on and sometimes we just have to treat them symptomatically with a de decontaminate them. The other thing that um, falls under the toxins is the lead poisoning in swans um, and other birds as well. But it, it's a really big one in the swans, and usually it's right at like December to this time. You know, we usually get a bunch of them in, but we haven't gotten any in this year, so that's a good thing. Four choices. Some animals have their own addictions, which you'll see a picture of that coming up. And then, of course, diseases such as mange, parvovirus, distemper virus, um, survivors from the storms or hurricanes, and animals that have been previously owned. So you have that person that found this baby raccoon and the mom was killed, and she took in the baby raccoon to raise it as her own. Now the baby raccoon's 50 pounds and becoming completely destructive in the house, and she doesn't know what to do with it, and she just wants to let it go in the wild. Those happen, mm -hmm. and those are very, very tricky situations. So always stabilize, first thing you want to do before you even go into any surgery or anything, you want to make sure the vitals in the animal are all stabilized. With the orphans, make sure they're comfortable, make sure they're warm, look for parasites, um, decontaminate them if needed, assess any, any injuries. Um, do not, it's, it's kind of like that motherly, fatherly instinct as soon as you get a baby raccoon in, oh gosh, I need to warm up some milk for yeah. him so he can eat because he's hungry. Well, we don't know when his last feeding was, and what we want to do is get him fluids first to give his stomach some time to just adjust to the fluids, and then gradually introduce the milk. If we introduce a milk that he's, to that he's not normally familiar with, we can end up causing GI upset and deal with diarrhea, which can be really challenging to get rid of in these guys. What kind of milk do you give them? Fox Valley actually has a wonderful formulated milk. Um, and that's what I use. I just go through Fox Valley and they have, it's specially formulated for raccoons. Okay. And they have squirrel ones, they okay. have rabbit ones, they've got fox, and they just, they got it all. Because most people think, oh, okay, well, it's just a baby. It can just have baby formula or yeah, milk. Well, no. that's not going to happen. No. Yeah, no problem. <coughs> and then, um, you can use some of the, you know, before Fox Valley came along, we would use KMR and Esbalac as well. And those still work. Um, they're, not, they're not as nutritionally healthy 
as as the Fox Valley ones, but they work fine. So if they work, they work. Go with it. Go with what you know sometimes. Whoops. Whoa. So um, animal attacks, you're gonna want to know what type of animal attack attacked your patient. And then you really want to know where. So if someone brings in a squirrel and they say, yeah, he got attacked somewhere in the body, check that chest over, check that abdomen over, check them over really good for any holes. Watch that breathing. And if anything seems funny, you're going to want to get them on oxygen right away. And um, those are ones you definitely want to have assessed by your veterinarian. So hitting the glass window. First, you're going to assess for any injuries. You can give it sub fluids, some pain meds, and some antibiotics. The biggest thing is oxygen support and keeping them in a warm, quiet, and dark location. So you could just, if they hit the window, put them in a box, get it all comfy, keep it quiet, and half the time in three, four hours, you open the box and they're gone. Mm. It's also the same for the drunk birds. Oh. They eat those berries. <coughs> uh, yes, I said drunk birds. They eat those berries, don't they? They eat the yeah. berries and they become intoxicated. Yeah. Learned that one when I was living in Florida. <laughs> Pretty smart. Um, this little bluebird came in, or blue jay came in, and, um, or mockingbird, I don't know, something. But she was all like just <laughs> staggery and couldn't walk and. I was talking to my mentor and I'm like, oh my gosh, is she, is she toxic? Has she got something going on with her? And she looked around her beak and she said, nope, she's drunk. And I'm like, what? And she says, yep, look at all around her beak and you can see like the little um, juice from the blueberries or whatever. And sure enough, she was drunk. She goes, eh, we just gotta let her sleep it off. She'll be fine in the morning. <laughs> she was in detail.